Let's try this again. Hi, everyone, and welcome. How is everyone doing today? Yay, excited faces. I'm, I'm equally excited. I could tick off New York City as a place where I've spoken. Uh, I think this is my 216 or 217 talk, but never in New York, so I'm super stoked to be here with you. And uh, there's been a lot of talks here, really interesting talks about how to spot uh, code or infrastructure that's behaving badly. And uh, eventually you come to trying to solve the problem by developing cacheable applications. And that's the topic we're gonna talk about. Now, before we can start, uh, there's a couple of statements that I wanna go over and I need to make sure that everyone here is on the same page. Because otherwise, what the hell, what am I doing here? Are we ready? ready. Yes, in in whoa. Interaction works, great, great. No, 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 not yet. Not yet. Do we agree that slow websites suck? Sure, yeah. Do we also agree that web performance is an essential part of the user experience? Yes, I see nodding for that, that's a good thing. Do we agree that a slow website is almost just as bad as a website that is down? Yeah, worse, even, even worse, worse, worse. The next stuff you don't really need to agree with, these are just statements of mine, because if that happens, you'll lose money, you'll lose face, you might even lose a bit, little bit of Google page rank because Google is getting increasingly more involved in the performance of your website, web application, API, and so on. Now, a lot of people try to remedy that by throwing servers at the problem. Oh, our website is slow after using all the wonderful tools by Blackfire and Datadog, and they know that it's slow, we're gonna throw servers at the problem, but unfortunately that's not really a solution because the almighty biggie said more money, more servers, more problems. Finally, I could use this reference, I've done this many, many times, in the town or in the state that man is from. So more money, more servers, more problems. And uh, a lot of people will try to identify the slowest parts, and this is the main reference to the previous presentations, which were excellent. Congrats to both speakers. Uh, so. That's, that makes sense, you're gonna do that. You're gonna identify the slowest parts, you're gonna try to optimize, but at a given point, you will run out of time, you will run out of developers, you run out of money. Developers cost money. And then you hit these limits or, or the point of diminishing returns as they call it, where the money you're investing in trying to make your website faster doesn't really re result in the milliseconds you're expecting there. So what are you gonna do? And this, this is the caching joke, you're gonna cache. Because caching, as the metaphor shows, is just storing computed stuff in boxes for later use. And uh, that being said, these were statements, this was the intro, hi, my name is Tace, and I had people asking me how to pronounce my name, Tace. If you're ever confused, imagine that this is a taser that security there will use if you misbehave. Tace, that's, that's my name. I'm a technical evangelist at Varnish Software. I'm a, we have a New York office apparently. It's my first time here in New York to visit my colleagues. A lot of fun. And uh, Varnish Software is the company behind the Varnish Cash Project. Who's heard of Varnish? For those, oh, a lot of people. Normally, if, if there's a few hands, I'd say room for potential, but a lot of people here know us already. I'm already also taste fitting on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, you name it. I don't mind being heckled. I don't mind criticism. So if you want to give me criticism or if you want to make fun of me online, you may do that right now. I have no issue with that. I'm also the author of Getting Started with Varnish Cash. And the goal, my personal goal was I brought a book, a book I wrote to raffle here, but unfortunately I forgot it. I tried to pack lightly and I forgot it. But hey, no big deal because we're hosting a meetup on Thursday where there'll be tons of books raffled. And if you want to, I still find it embarrassing. I'm willing to sign those books. Let's, let's talk about that now. July 25th here in New York, uh, six till nine at Barcade in Chelsea. Here's the link. If you want to come, if you want a free book, if you want free tokens for, man, this is slow, for Barcade where, where you can play games, you want to have some free tokens, free drinks, free books, uh, just register right there. All right, that was our commercial interlude. Let's start with the real deal. When I was in school, my database teacher told me to never recompute what you can store. You, no, it was actually the other way around. Don't store stuff you could recompute. But the world has changed, the internet has changed, and I would advise you to do the exact opposite, is don't recompute data if the data hasn't changed. This is a Drupal meetup group, right? So who were the Drupalistas at? Surprising low amount of Drupalists. Well, well, PHP regardless. Like, let's say you get a request, 
request is processed by your web server, web server takes it, let's say you use Apache and you use PHP FPM, then it's sent to PHP FPM. You saw what Sammy did about the lexing and the opcode. So there's a, a considerable amount of computer effort going into computing that. And maybe if you use a MySQL database, it has to connect to MySQL and the response from MySQL has to come back. It has to be processed by PHP. You catch my drift, it has to come back to Apache and it has to go back all the way to you. Every single goddamn time, even if the data hasn't changed. So that's a bit of overhead. So I would say that caching is not really a trick, but it can be an essential part of your strategy. And the caching we'll do is HTTP-based caching. Now I hear you say, I hear you say, Tace, what are you doing? You're talking about HTTP-based caching? That's the stuff we use in browsers. And we all know that we can't really rely on browsers for caching. Yes, that's true. But in reality, we'll be talking about reverse caching proxies. Systems you put in front of your machine, in front of your server, to remediate the potential delays and to perform caching. And it uses the exact mechanisms that browsers use for caching. So under normal circumstances, your user will directly interface with the server and responses will come back. That is the normal thing. But if you use a reverse caching proxy like Varnish, Varnish is a reverse caching proxy, there'll be a system in between. Now that system can be on the same physical box or same virtual machine, but it could also be a separate machine. The user has no clue that he or she is communicating with a proxy. For the user, it's just an endpoint. Whereas under some circumstances, the server, the end server, the origin as we'll call it, has no clue that there's a proxy in between. Most of the times it will, but oftentimes it has no clue. And it just does the negotiation and will take a request and check if the request is in cache. And if it's not in cache, it will forward it to the server. The server will respond. And the response will be stored here in memory or on disk. And for every second, third, fourth future call, the user will hit directly to the proxy and the proxy will serve it. And there will be a very low amount of resource consumption. That's the end goal. I see confused faces like a lot of confused faces. That's why I always provide this very image. Okay, pop quiz. Who's this gentleman? Kevin Costner. Who's that lady? What is the movie? The Bodyguard. Wow, what a crowd, what an audience. Uh, your PHP application, origin server, varnish. Thank you, thank you. Kevin Costner, so when in doubt, when, conf when you're confused about reverse caching proxies like Varnish, Kevin Costner, who plays Frank Farmer in the movie, will make sure that the origin server, that Whitney, is protected from stalky fans, in this case, excessive amounts of requests. So when in doubt, think about the bodyguards. All right? Okay, we can move on now. Uh, Varnish cache is, the, of course, the tool... I'm gonna talk about Varnish Cache as an open source project that is uh, in conjunction with Varnish Enterprise, which is our enterprise product. If we took, take the numbers of all of that, if you look at the top 10,000 websites, 20% uses Varnish. And in total, I guess approximately 5 million people will use our stuff. So those are some general numbers, both open source and enterprise. And we, as, as I indicated, leverage all the typical stuff you know and that browsers use. So you can use the good old expires header that explains when content is no longer deemed valid, when it is considered stale. Or we can use a much more flexible mechanism, a much more flexible instrument called cache control. Uh, ways to cache, ways not to cache. Now we're gonna need your help. If we look at the middle one, how long is a reverse caching proxy gonna cache this? Anyone? I see, yes. One day. It's actually the first time I've done this presentation 20 times, the first time that someone says a day and not an hour. Because usually people stare and glare at max H and think, oh, I know this header, this is how long it should be cached, an hour. But there is a specific construct, a specific piece of language in HTTP that is defined for shared devices, S. The only thing the description or the spec is not good at is it naming things max dash h s dash max h it's a little bit confusing but s dash max h is for every system that is in between your end user and the server and in this case your browser is going to cache an hour but varnish is going to cache for a day if either of these pops up varnish will not cache and that gives you as an end user the possibility to control the behavior of the cache be it varnish be it a cdn be it anything else you 
have the empowerment, you have the power to change the behavior of the cash. Now, in an ideal world, let's talk about ideal worlds right now, and I have to take into account that there's a slight lag between what's happening on my laptop and what's happening here on screen. In an ideal world, applications are stateless because HTTP is stateless, and you have a well-defined TTL, and cache and no cache resources per action, per controller action, and we'll use cache variations if cache variations, vary headers are required. And in order not to excessive, excessively query the backend, we'll do conditional requests. And for stuff that is not cacheable, we'll use placeholders and we'll use HI's logic for personalized caching. We all do this, right? Yes, we all, we live in an ideal, of course. Very confident, confidently looking people say, yes, yes, this is happening. Now, reality, if you will, reality actually sucks. In reality, this doesn't really happen. Because uh, a lot of websites use cookies and cookies aren't cacheable. As soon as a reverse caching proxy sees a cookie, it will say, hey, I can't cache this by design, of course, because if a cookie is set, this means the content is for your eyes only. It is personalized data, so you can't really cache it. And even if you say you don't use cookies, I'm telling you, you use cookies. So there's, there's always cookies. And a lot of people have no clue what a time to live is. Who, who, who creates cache control headers in its application and deliberately sets time to live specifically to, okay, a couple of people more than I would expect, but still not everyone. Who uses cache variations if eventually, yes. So the vary header, a couple of people. A lot of people don't, a lot of people have no clue. And even if you're willing to do all this, there's this thing called legacy code. There's code that you don't want to touch with a stick. So even if you're, if you're wanting to do that, it's not always possible. But what if I could tell you, you can design software with HTTP caching in mind. So there's always a way of solving this and, and usually it's quite intrusive in the code. I'm gonna to try to do it in the least intrusive way that I can. And we're gonna sort of create a caching state of mind where Everything that we do to control the behavior of the cache will be portable. We wanna achieve portability. If we use a different stack, different technology for a different platform, if we decide not to use Varnish anymore, but another piece of technology that it just works just as fine, as long as that piece of technology respects HTTP's best practices. We also wanna talk about developer empowerment because in my experience, I've worked with Varnish for, for over a decade. Varnish is a reverse caching proxy configuration is very much a system administration problem, whereas it should be included from the get-go in your development stack. It's about control and it's about consistent caching behavior. That is what we're gonna do. And uh, we're gonna do it in PHP because I come from the wonderful world of PHP. I've been uh, in the PHP scene for a while now and uh, I'm gonna build or show you a couple of snippets written in, in Symfony for that matter. I've written a small Symfony example application and we're gonna do different things. Number one, Cache control, we're gonna include cache control headers in a reasonably simple way. The, what we could do is say, we wanna make it public. So public means both for browsers and for reverse caching proxies. And we design a SMAX H of 500 seconds. So the page can be cached for 500 seconds. How do we do that? Reasonably simple, we have, and you could translate whatever you're gonna see now to Laravel or different frameworks. We all have the concept of uh, sort of s controllers with actions in there and in those actions, eventually you're gonna return an HTTP response. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna render a typical Twig template and we're gonna set these two parameters. Set shared max H, so that's as max H, set it to 500 and make sure it's public. Reasonably simple. There's other ways of doing that by uh, like very non-intrusive by registering event handlers and then hooking into it and checking certain parameters like the URL and then deciding whether or not you want to cache it. So that's very non-intrusive, but this is, this is simple from the get-go, right? You go to your controller, you add these parameters, and all of a sudden you have control over how long certain items will be cached. If you don't want them to be cached, let's say you want private no store, you could do it like this. There's also language constructs here. Set private to start with, and then you could add cache control directives to your header collection, and then you just add no store and you're good to go. This means whatever happens, the reverse caching proxy cannot cache this page. Simple, right? Still on board? Yes? If you're falling asleep, I don't mind. Do whatever you do, it's your meetup. Number two, conditional requests. Who's heard of conditional requests? 
maybe for those who haven't heard of it, maybe you have, but in a different, under a different name, under a different flag. Uh, and the idea here is that you only want to fetch payload that has changed. So let's say you cache something for 500 seconds. After that 500 seconds, the data will be considered stale and you need to revalidate with the backend. If you do that, you'll expect 200 and everything will be fine. But if the data hasn't changed at the backend level, why do this again? Why do this backend call while go through all this code? Why, like I, I explained to you that you have to go to the web server and the application runtime and the database. Why do that again? There are simpler and far more efficient ways of doing that. Like normally this is what you would get. 200 okay, everything's good. You get the payload, you store it in cache, you reset the timer and you deliver it to the end user. But what you could do is design your application in such a way that you don't need to if the data hasn't changed and just return a 304 not modified. Now Varnish supports 304 not modifies all the way like end to end from your backend application. It could detect it and if it hasn't changed, reset the TTL and it can send that header through to your browser so that your browser doesn't have to do it either. Because the fun thing about a 304 not modified is it starts with a tree. So there's no actual payload. It's a sort of redirection, just like 301, 302. But 304 says nothing has changed and it's an empty piece of body. There's no data being transferred over the wire. So from the start, you already have less bandwidth consumption, which is, which is good. But there's ways to reduce memory effort and CPU or IO at the same time. I'm going to show you how. Now, first, we're going to go through the motions of how you can detect whether or not something has, has changed or not. And eTags is a way to do that. Let's say we, this is all curl. You request uh, the homepage on your local host, your local development system. And the system says, yeah, hello world, output 200 OK, everything's fine. But it defines an e tag. And an e tag is an arbitrary value that identifies your content. It's a sort of fingerprint of your content. So you could take your actual content and do an MD5 or a SHA or whatever and just use it as such. Now, our regular browser, like your Chromes and your Internet Explorers and your Firefoxes, will then, upon the next request to that same resource, inject the e tag under the form of an if non match header. So you address the very same resource and that e tag is stored in an if non match. And then it's up to you to detect that if non match header, take that value and then compute if that has changed. And if it hasn't, you just say 304 not modified, done, end. Let me show you how to build that. Uh, there's also another way of doing that using last modified header. So rather than using fingerprints of your content, you could say this is the date and the time, the exact date and time when it has changed. It has changed on July 22nd, 2016. GMT, of course, that very timestamp. And then upon the next one, you could say, if last modified here, 304 not modified. So these are two instruments. I prefer the e-tag way because it's simpler, but timestamps can work as well. This is, a, this is an interesting one. So a reverse caching proxy like Varnish will do all of that negotiation asynchronously. And while this is happening, while it is revalidating with the backend whether or not the data has changed, it will serve stale data to the end user. So if you have a million users going to your website, this is not just uh, an excessive word, a million, like there are people who actually have millions of visitors coming to their website. If in your code you say stale while revalidate 20, Varnish will take for the next 20 seconds, will serve all data while it is revalidating. So it will add 20 seconds to your time to live while that is happening. And uh, there's, we call this in Varnish, we call this grace mode. You give it a bit of grace, but there is an official way of doing this without relying on Varnish. You can instrument that using stale wire validate in your cache control. Yes? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Well, there, there is no like 20, like it could be lower even. Like imagine, would it take 20 seconds to load a single page on a system that is not really under heavy load because you have a reverse caching proxy? In, in reality, it will be lower, I guess. I would set it to a lower value. It can be higher. This is just, I just built a stupid uh, proof of concept application and 20 seconds was the amount of patience I had. So this is my patience level, 20 seconds. Makes sense, right? A lot of people have lower thresholds, I guess, in terms of patience. Yes. Well, regardless, uh, Varnish has a, a built-in request coalescing thing that a lot of caches don't have. It, it will pull them all together, and the first one will trigger a backend request, and all the other ones will be on hold. And as soon as the first one responds, not only will it be stored in parallel in memory, but all of these waiting connections will be fed the data instantly. 
Yes, because it has to be in cash. But if it's not in cash, everyone will be waiting, will be put on hold, but there will be no cash stampede. There will never be a cash stampede. No, never. It will, they will all be waiting until that data is retrieved. Like even if the data is not cacheable, if it's private or the max age is set to zero, there will not be a cache stampede because it, Varnish will have a thread sending it to the backend that is processing it and everyone else will be waiting until the data returns. And that process will be reiterated upon every single request if the data is not cacheable. So you have a mechanism in there to protect you, but you also have a mechanism in there to decide whether or not to serve stale data straight away. So you don't have to put them on hold. That's that mechanism. Now, my idea of implementing this in your PHP application is to validate really quickly whether or not the data has changed in a sort of pre in a sort of pre bootstrapping stage. The first thing you do before you load your full application is to detect that request is, that is incoming, like if, through an if last modified or if non match. Can we validate that on a sort of mechanism that's super fast? Let's say Redis, for example, if we store these, this data in Redis, can we quickly detect whether or not we should return a three or four modified? And if that is the case, you exit super early out of your application without having to bootstrap the full application, without having to connect to your database, without having to do anything else. So instead of just having the bonus of low um, bandwidth consumption, you have you could really exit quite early. And like I would use in my example application, I store my e tags in Redis, and I uh, I just have an, a listener, so I don't. That's what I mean with a non-intrusive code. I just have a listener that takes Redis as a dependency, and that has an is uh, is modified code which just recycles some Redis logic, uh, Symfony logic router that takes your request and gets the e tags from the request, meaning it looks at an if non match header and then decides has it changed or has it not changed. So is modified true, otherwise true or false, really simple. And then on the next page, we hook into the request part, get the event, get the request from the event and just take the URI, MD5 it and get it like e tag, this is just a prefix and get it from Redis. And then take that e tag and check if it's modified. And if, it, if it's not modified, just immediately quit, immediately. Don't bootstrap the rest of your application. And if it has changed, you will go to the response because the response will be triggered and then you'll store it in Redis. And that way you just have to register that one event listener and all of a sudden the amount of memory consumption on your application, maybe even CPU cycles will drop dramatically. And this will be triggered only if you have a reverse caching proxy in front of it, like Varnish, this will be triggered only if the cache is invalid. Let's say you have an hour worth of caching. After that hour, an asynchronous call will be sent to that system. And that way, your system won't be overloaded. And an additional bonus is if you have rapidly changing data, using this mechanism, you can have super low TTLs, a TTL of a second, two seconds, and then just asynchronously validate piece by piece by piece, and it will be safe. All right. Still with me? Number three, content composition and placeholders. Imagine this very, very straightforward setup where you have a header, footer, navigation, and main page. Now, imagine there's shopping cart information or account information. Welcome, Tess, or you have three items in shopping cart. This is not really cacheable, is it? Right? This is one of the major challenges that e-commerce platforms have. Because as soon as there's a session cookie in play, you won't have any cache. Two ways, because if you trigger a session, you'll have a set cookie. And set cookies will be caught by Varnish because that is a change that will say, then Varnish won't cache it. But upon the next request, when your browser has the cookie and sends it to, to Varnish, Varnish won't cache it either. So you're basically stuck on a single HTTP response because HTTP doesn't really have basic notions of, of different fragments. And it will take the lowest common denominator, which means don't cache. So if one piece of your code, if one piece of your output is not cacheable, the entire page is not cacheable by default. I'd like to stress by default, there's ways around this. I'm gonna show you. Because we're gonna use placeholders. Specific parts that are not cacheable will use placeholders to do that. And you already know a certain, what, what kind of placeholder technology do you use to solve these kinds of situations? Pretty sure you know, very typical one. Yes, of course, Ajax. You use Ajax oftentimes to do this. And the frameworks and e-commerce platforms out there will do that as well. So Ajax is, uh, is a very easy way of doing this. And you could use an Ajax call. Man, this is slow. 
like I've pressed it five seconds ago and now it pops up. Uh, you can use that Ajax call for non-cached content and that would be a separate route in your framework and that would be uh, private, no cache, no store, as max age zero, max age zero. And then you can go on with the rest of your work because all the rest will be cached. But you'll have a little bit of a performance impact on that very one route. So you need to optimize that for lots of loads. But there's another way of doing this. Edge side includes. Who's heard of edge side includes? Who is old enough to have heard of server side includes? All right, it's more people. It's the same deal, same deal. Placeholder, but instead of being processed on the server, remember you could do Perl calls in HTML that would be processed by Apache. It happens on the edge. And with on the edge, I mean the outer tier of your application, which in our case is a varnish server. So what you would do, and this is for the people who know SSI, it looks quite similar. It's a tag. It's like an XHTML tag where you refer to an endpoint, in this case, header, where our shopping cart information is, where other information is. And uh, it's a W3C standard. It was invented by the lovely people at Akamai, which are uh, CDN people. Basically, Varnish is also CDN technology in general. Like, there are CDNs out there that use our technology. So it's very much the same thing. And what we do here is have this parsed by Varnish. And it's up to you as an application developer to take this into account. And uh, even frameworks like Symfony take this into account out of the box. Let me show you what we can do here. Varnish, in order for this to work on Symfony applications, Varnish has to emit a surrogate capability header where it says it supports ESI. It's a sort of announcement. Hey, I'm Varnish, I support ESI. Because as I mentioned in one of the very first slides, oftentimes your end user, the application that you develop for your end user is not aware that there's a reverse caching proxy. By setting this, your application will be aware, okay, there's a system in front of me and it supports ESI. And then it's up to you to emit this, but also send a surrogate control header in order for Varnish to parse it because Varnish doesn't always know what it needs to parse. By emitting this surrogate control header and Symfony does this automatically, it will be parsed as ESI. So basically what you can do is have this non-cached ESI placeholder. And how will you do that? I'll show you in a minute, but first I need to show you the benefits and advantages and disadvantages. I like ESI a lot because it's server side and it's standardized and it's processed on the edge, which makes it faster. Because uh, in a lot of cases, Ajax calls are just extra round trips that you shift away to the end user. It's the end user's responsibility, it's the browser's responsibility. But on shitty 3G connections, that's an extra round trip you can avoid. But the problem with edge side includes is that by default in the open source project, they're sequential. So if you have four ESI calls, it will be four calls after one another. In our enterprise product, they're parallel. If one fails, all fail. So if you have one that returns a 500 error, your entire page blows up, you're done. There's no graceful degradation. And very limited implementation in our technology. And other technologies, very limited implementation. It's invented by Akamai, so Akamai has the full spec. They probably support it all in their CDN. So it's not always common, common knowledge. Ajax is a lot easier, a lot more implementations, a lot more examples you can find online. Now, the cool thing is that it's client-side, so it, the implementation is really simple. It's written in JavaScript, so it's common knowledge. And you can do it in parallel, and if one fails, you can catch it and do graceful degradation. And with graceful degradation, I mean, rather than blowing up your entire page, you could decide to not load that one component. Having 90% of your functionality on the page is a lot better than having 0% of your functionality. So Ajax, in that respect, is a lot easier. But the problem is it's processed by the browser. So that means extra round trips, which means in essence, it's quite slower because you depend on the network of the end user. So it's up to you to decide what you want to use, the one or the other. But in terms of implementing this, this is very much a decision that is made at the view layer. You're probably not going to do that at the controller layer or in the business logic. At the view layer, you're going to decide the composition of your different fragments. And uh, let me show you how that works. Instead of having a single uh, controller or a single controller action to load your page, you'll have different ones. You have your index, you have your header, your footer, and your navigation. And some parts won't be cacheable, other parts will be cacheable. So you need one for every, every one. And then at the view layer, if all goes well, yes. Instead of using includes to load Twig files, that represents the different fragments, just to keep track of everything, you're gonna use this twig function that is called render ESI. And it will take, as an argument, takes a route. And that route could be composed via URL. So I'm taking the header, and the header will be loaded here. Now, there's a little bit of intelligence in there. 
again, out of the gate, out of the box, you don't have to do anything for it. That render ESI function will automatically negotiate with Varnish. It will automatically emit a circuit capability header and it will send out a circuit control header. If it turns out it doesn't see a circuit capability header, it will default to an internal sub request. So even if you don't have Varnish, you can use this because if it fails, you won't notice because it will do an internal sub request. Internal sub requests are slightly slower than just a simple file call. But if you're planning to use this in production with a reverse caching proxy with a CDN in front of it, this could well work. So what will happen as, a, as an end result is that these tags will be in your HTML and Varnish will be clever enough to parse them and uh, store them separately. So basically you'll have 90% of your page being cached and that one fragment where your shopping cart information is, where your account information is, it won't be cached. Make sense? It's up to you to decide what to use. Number four, cache variations. Question, an honest question. How do you identify objects in cache? How do you do that? What parameters do you use to identify something in cache? Anyone? Excuse me? It's a lot more simpler than you think, the URL. A resource, an HTTP-based resource. Most of the cases you use the URL to know what's going on. But the URL, so as I indicated, the URL identifies. Even in Varnish, it takes the host name or the IP address and the URI, and that's the identifier for something in cache. But in a lot of cases, the output of a URL is not unique. There could, could be different circumstances. So let's say, what, what if the, the content that actually uh, is identified by the URL is different, varies based on a specific request header? Maybe accept header, accept language, all these kinds of values, maybe a cookie. Well, let's say you're screwed. You're screwed. You can't really do anything without that. So let's say you have a multilingual website and you use accept language to identify it. The first one that comes in is the language that's going to be stored in cache. So I'm a Dutch native speaker. If, if Christophe would go first, right? He's French speaking. It would be in French. Luckily, I speak French. I'm not sure if everyone speaks French in here. So you basically screwed. So accept language. I speak English, I speak Dutch, a bit of German, and if the page here is English, so you detect that either of those is uh, supported, you can use content language. But that's not really gonna cut it. So what the solution is gonna be is in your application, you're gonna set a vary header, and that vary header is again standardized and will be respected by Varnish, by CDN technology, by other reverse caching proxies. And what it will do is create a subtree in your cache and store all the variations. There is an important responsibility for you as a developer because if these accept language values, have you ever seen these accept language values? They can get quite crazy. For every single value, you have a variation. The more variations you have, the lower your hit rate goes up until a point that it's no longer acceptable. So it's up to you to create a sort of either a blacklist or a whitelist to control what the end user is setting you. Because in, when we learn about security, we always, we're always thought that you cannot you trust the end user. You're going to have people who are going to get clever and who are going to inject crazy accept language headers. So you need to deal with that, either in your application or at the Varnish level. Varnish could also do that. What you can do in Varnish using specific modules is say, I accept Dutch, I accept English, I accept French, and everything else is going to fall back to English. And that way you only have four variations of each page, which is more or less acceptable. What if, if all else fails? Like, let, let's say you've done all of that or you tried all of that, but you can't leverage any of this. How do you proceed? You can't use vary headers, cache control headers. Let's say it's a, it's a legacy application. How do you deal with it? How do you continue? Well, what you need to do is write VCL code. VCL stands for Varnish Configuration Language. It's a sort of DSL, the main specific language that gets compiled to C whenever Varnish is started up and that allows you to control the cache in an unparalleled way. I'm not gonna talk about VCL in detail because uh, unlike Sammy, I don't have spans of time. We're probably, got that here. see what I did there? Uh, we're gonna reach the end and you're gonna have drinks and so. So uh, this is a quick example from Drupal 7. This is a, a little bit of a snippet that Drupal 7 people use. So this is a hook. So we have different kinds of hooks, subroutines that hook into the finite state machine that Varnish has in terms of decision making. And when you receive a request or when Varnish rec receives a request and the request URL matches a regular expression that matches either, either one of these, it will decide not to cache. So instead of just leveraging, yes? 
Right. Blackfire, a little bit of Blackfire commercial right end. No, it's not shameless. It's all right. I accept that. I do shameless stuff myself. So uh, sometimes you need to inject certain things in the VCL because you can't leverage it through HTTP. In, my, in an ideal world, even if you use cookie values, you will have no cache so that Varnish won't cache it so that you don't have to write this VCL. But in a lot of situations, you have to write VCL. If you use Drupal, because this is a Drupal meetup, you're going to have to write VCL because you can't do it out of the gate all the time. So this construction says you cannot cache this page. This is what it does. Uh, <laughs> this is a lot more interesting, right? We use a lot of regex mumbo jumbo in, in we're fond of it in Varnish. So what this does, it, it removes all the cookies. This is also Drupal 7. It removes every single cookie, all the tracking cookies, everything you have. But if it sees a no cache cookie value or something that contains session or S session, it will remove everything besides that one. And if the cookie, after removing all of the cookies, is an empty string, you will unset it and it will be cacheable. And otherwise, it won't be cacheable. So what this basically does is if you log into Drupal in the admin module, you'll have a session cookie it won't cache. For everything else, it will cache. So these, these are tricks to, to make it work in a way. There's far more. I, I have plenty of presentations I do about advanced VCL. This is not one of them. I just wanted to show you that there's a, a way to control this even if your code doesn't allow it. And we're nearly going to end the presentation, but I have to see. See, I'm shameless myself, Christophe. I, I need to inject a little bit of commercial stuff. So Varnish Cache can do all of that and is used by like four or five million websites. And if you look at the top 10,000, as I mentioned, 20% uses us. But we also have an enterprise product that adds a little bit more to it. And I'm just going to give you really, really short. I'm going to keep it under 30 seconds if I can. Overview of the stuff we do. Uh, we're involved with SSL because out of the box, Varnish doesn't support SSL. You could terminate SSL in front of Varnish and then do HTTP in, in the enterprise version. We have that out of the box. We do ESI in parallel. We have a storage engine because a lot of the biggest uh, video on demand and live streaming providers in the world use our technology to also accelerate their video content because that's also HTTP in case you didn't know. We have encryption, throttling, rate limiting. We can also do prefetching of certain stuff. Like I have a proof of concept where you can have a link header, an actual link header or link meta tags where we prefetch CSS and JavaScript and store it in the cache. Uh, we have geolocation features, authentication. We have a uh, quick template parsing on the edge where you can personalize your cache. Plenty of stuff, high availability, yada, yada, yada. The stuff that typical enterprises need. Uh, and uh, yes. Enterprise. No, you don't. You're a Drupalist. Uh, you use Drupal 8. Then you're covered with open source. But we are working with the Drupal community. That, like, I come from the PHP community, so I like interacting with different PHP communities. And we're working with the Drupal community to use one of our, because in Drupal 8, you have a notion of tags that are added so you can invalidate specific pieces of content, which was not possible in Drupal 7. In Drupal 8, that's a game changer. And we have a specific, uh, it's called XKey, is a, a module we have to do more improved invalidation of content. And we're working closely with, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Wem Leers. Wem Leers is one of the core Drupal developers who is in charge of caching, uh, making sure that it goes along. Wem is also Belgium, so communicating with him is quite easy for us. Now, the final piece, and, and I'm, I'm going to I have a presentation I'm building on that for a, a conference in Belgium where the organizers are sitting in the back. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a, a talk called uh, Caching the Uncacheable. And uh, I'm going to give a, like a small glimpse, like a couple of seconds of glimpse of, in, of edge content transformation, which is also very useful uh, in, the, in terms of in the caching space. A lot of stuff on a slide. So imagine your user is connecting to your, uh, it's, it's, own, it's enterprise only, unfortunately, to your Varnish enterprise server with a cookie, with a session ID in it. Again, Symfony. It processes it and it will output hello username, but instead of making it uncacheable and putting the username in here based on what's stored in your session, session that happens to be stored in Redis. I see Redis geek t-shirts there. Fortunately, the gentleman fall, fell asleep, I guess. Yeah. It's not bad. It's all right. I told him he could do that. It's, it's perfectly fine. I told him from the get-go. So uh, normally, this would be uncacheable. And the value would come from this symphony uh, session 
where the ID matches what's stored in the cookie. But what we can do is you can just send this to Varnish and Varnish will store it as a template and then our Edge Stash module will, instead of the application fetching it from this, from, from this session, we in VCL can call Redis, get that information and get that username out and parse it on the Edge. So instead of working with Ajax or Edge Site Includes and then decide not to cache something, this is very low overhead. Varnish is super fast, Redis is fast. If you combine those two, instead of deciding not to cache, you could just let Varnish do the trick. And then uh, that's my next presentation that I'm already building. I'm building the proof of concept to show that. And that's uh, my topic called caching the uncacheable. Now, uh, the problem with enterprises, enterprise costs money and we don't like spending money. Developers don't like spending money. Your bosses might, but if you wanna give this a go, all these cool modules, and uh, if, if you want to know more, you can talk to me. We have AWS images out there where you don't have to pay license fee, and you just play around. There's free trials, and uh, there's a small surplus on, uh, on the AWS cost. And for, for basically peanuts, you can play with enterprise technology that is used by some really high-end companies. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I can tick New York City off my box of cities I've spoken at. And see you next time. Again, I was supposed to have this book with me. I forgot it, stupid. But if you want the book, come to our meetup Thursday. RSVP, otherwise you can't come. Free tokens for drinks, free tokens for games, free books, and maybe you can win an Amazon gift voucher. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot everybody for being here tonight. Uh, talking about books, we still have a couple of Blackfire books on the table. Um, and else there is also some beers left. So yeah, feel free to uh, stick around for a little while. And uh, thanks again. <laughs>